Amen. We will now begin with the church theme song, These Are the Days of Elijah. We ask everyone to stand to his or her feet as we praise the Lord this morning. Amen. 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 Verses 
Why not just start from the first verse here, Amen. the 10th verse. It says, Amen. the earth is the Lord's and its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessings from the Lord yes. and righteousness from the God of his salvation. If you know it, you can sing along with us. Amen. Very simple phrase and praise. I think we know that one. Oh, we know it. It Upon my heart, come on, just touch yes, yourself. This yes, is what yes. I want the Lord to do. Yes. Jenny, rest upon me tonight. Rest, rest, rest. Rest, rest like you do in the morning. morning. Hallelujah. And if you really mean it, come on and just lift your hands and say thank you.
statement. The mission of members of the Perfecting the Kingdom International is to actively walk in the lifestyle of a true disciple of Christ's kingdom. According to Matthew 4 19, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I commit myself to the task of lifting up Christ from the earth weekly by obeying Christ's commission, becoming a fisher of men by inviting and bringing someone to church with me on Sunday. We will proactively share our testimony of how we are being blessed to lay down in green pasture and share it with our family, friends, and co-workers by inviting them to come and enjoy the great feast of the Lord. We declare ourselves to be Jesus' witnesses according to Acts 1 and 8, to be about our Father's kingdom business, that after pastor has sown a fresh anointing word, we will be a gather in God's harvest of souls to be fed, healed, and empowered within this metro Atlanta metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. Lord, Amen. anoint me as a Samaritan woman in John 4 and 39, which says, and many other Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified in Luke 14 and 17, to send us as God's servants to invite many to come to the great supper of the Lord. Amen. 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 At this time, I'd like to ask everyone to join me in the reading of our Statement of Faith, which is located on the back page of the bulletin. When you have located, please stand to your feet and say amen. 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 The Statement of Faith, and it reads, We, we believe the Bible to be the entire and only now written word of God. We believe that there is only one God, Eternally existent in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We believe according to Genesis 2 and 24 that the institution of marriage is between one man and one woman. We believe in the blessed hope, which is the rapture of the Church of God, which is in Christ at His return. We believe that the only means of being cleansed from sin is through repentance and faith in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We believe that the regeneration by the Holy Ghost is absolutely essential for personal salvation. We believe that the redemptive work of Christ on the cross provides healing for the human body in answering to believing prayers. We believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, according to Acts 2 and 4, is given to believers who ask for it. We believe in the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, by whose indwelling the Christian is enabled to live a holy and separated life in this present world. We believe in the resurrection of both the saved and the lost, the one to everlasting life, and the other to everlasting shame and damnation. And this is what we believe. Amen. 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 
Statement of Faith en Spanish. Declaración de fe. Creemos que la Biblia es la única inspirada e inefable palabra de Dios. Creemos que hay un solo Dios eterno, Dios el Padre, Dios el Hijo y Dios el Espíritu Santo. Creemos, según Génesis 2, 24, que la institución del matrimonio es entre un hombre y una mujer. Creemos en la esperanza bendita, la cual es el rapto de la iglesia de Cristo en su retorno. Creemos que la única manera de ser limpiado del pecado es por medio del arrepentimiento y por la fe en la preciosa sangre de Cristo Jesús. Creemos que la regeneración por medio del Espíritu Santo es absolutamente esencial para la salvación personal. Creemos que la obra redentora de Cristo en la cruz provee sanidad a la humanidad en respuesta de oraciones de creyentes. Creemos, según Hechos 2.4, que el bautismo del Espíritu Santo está a los creyentes que lo piden. Creemos en el poder santificador del Espíritu Santo que mora en el cristiano, permitiéndole vivir una vida santa y apartada de este mundo. Creemos en la resurrección para ambos, el salvado y el perdido. El uno a vida eterna y el otro a condenación y vergüenza perpetua. Y esto es lo que creemos. Amén. 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 Please remain standing. At this time, this afternoon, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the song and present to others our pastor. He's coming forward this afternoon to bring us a word from the Lord. Amen. Let's welcome him, saints. Pastor God bless you, uh, beloved. Uh, perfecting the Kingdom International, uh, we appreciate you. Uh, this is Pastor Elijah Hill. Just uh, wanted to share with you all, uh, basically, um, we thank God for the vision of the church. Um, I know we're in a point of transition at this particular time, but I want you guys to know that God is, is in the blessing business and, and he is about to bless us and bring us into a greater place. Now, I had an opportunity to share with some of you guys in the new members class about our vision. Uh, the vision is for us to acquire uh, probably about 20 acres of land here in Lithonia, Georgia, or in the stock, uh, the stock, uh, let me see, the Stonecrest area off of I-20 or somewhere there's about, doesn't have to be right directly off of I-20, but somewhere in there. So, and uh, we, we thank God for that. That's what our goal is. And as you guys continue to support us, we, you know, we're going to meet our goal. I know God is going to help us to do what it is that, you know, we want to do. Now, first of all, uh, acquiring land is what we want to do. We want to own, as the Bible is, God told the Israelites to go to the promised land. God promises you real estate. So we want to go move to real estate ownership, number one. Number two, we want to be able to own that land so that we don't have to move again. Uh, the next, we're going to build a, a, a facility. We might maybe purchase a piece of land with a house on it or something and maybe be able to, uh, to build from there. Or we'll just outright build a building, you know, from there. And so uh, I'll be showing you all the slides. You'll be seeing those also. Uh, basically, uh, we're also looking at uh, building a subdivision. Now, the reason why we want to acquire so much land is because we want to build out a subdivision where we want to build a shopping center, you know, adjacent to the church, uh, where we can uh, help people entrepreneurially and in businesses. We want to have our own strip mall, basically. And so we can be able to facilitate businesses. We Now, we talked about that in the new members class. We talked about some of you all came up with different ideas for businesses and things like that. So we, that's what we want to do. We want to build businesses and we want the church to have such an economic strength that it's a blessing to you all that have supported us and uh, in addition to the strip mall we want to also build uh, a, a couple apartment complexes in that 20 acres of land uh, basically so that will keep the financial strength up of the organization and also as I'm also working on developing a movie myself uh, I always have had my organization the National Entertainment Technology Academy so then we want to also be able to build a, um, a, a studio for children and, and, and teenagers and adults 
so that they can learn uh, in the entertainment industry. Um, it's mainly for training purposes and developing jobs from that standpoint. And then from there, we want to build a section of a subdivision of homes, you know, for perfecting the kingdom for our ministry and for those that are in the ministry that we'll be selling. All right. So there's several things that we're going to be doing in our vision, and I hope you all would continue to support us. If you look at the donate button when you do go to give a five for perfecting the kingdom, those of y'all that give your offering, uh, would you please uh, touch a, a new facility if you would like to contribute to support us in the purchase of land? And there's an option there for that. There's an option for your tithing, your offering, and et cetera, et cetera. And I would like you all to continue to give toward our Pakistani uh, orphanage. And we thank you for that. Um, so, uh, Greetings. Praise the Lord. Here, Pastor Kashan from Pakistan. Overseas ministries uh, serve the kingdom of God uh, with the Perfecting Kingdom International Church uh, with Pastor Elijah Hill who is supporting us, uh, our orphanage, and uh, be uh, partnering with us. So we are just give a great thanks for great man of God, Pastor Elijah Hill. Uh, thank you so much, Pastor Elijah, uh, for giving us, us time today uh, that we greet to our, all our friends uh, to be a blessing of us and supporting our ministry here in Pakistan and look after fa fatherless needy children here in Pakistan. So we give great thanks to you uh, for this privilege and honor for us, for me. And uh, here is my beautiful wife, uh, Michelle Kashan. So she's also served the ministry of Pakistan. We both served, uh, serve the Lord and glorify the body of God and serve His kingdom. So it's privilege and honor for me. Uh, today, I just greet to all of you. So once again, thank you, Pastor Elijah. So here is my beautiful darling wife, Michelle. So she would love to share uh, with our friends, those who are uh, live uh, watching us, uh, are serving with us and uh, be a blessing for us and uh, supporting our orphanage here in Pakistan. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Kashan, Pastor Kashan's wife and I'm working here in Pakistan. Last 12 years, we know each other, Pastor Elijah Hill, and through his prayer, God will bless me, and God will provide me what my heart desire. I'm so blessed, a part of Perfecting Kingdom International Ministry in America, because Pastor Elijah Hill prayed for me, and then God will bless me, the beautiful son. Last couple of years that we are connected, prophesize me. when. I have my desire that God will bless me, the beautiful son. So I share with Pastor Elijah Hill. On that time, he pray for me. And then he prayed for me. He asked me that God will bless you this year. On that time, I am very desperately need a baby boy. So God will bless me through Pastor Elijah. And God bless me, the beautiful son, Elijah. Because through his prayer, we decided that we chose the name Elijah, our son. So we are so blessed to have a part of. So I would love to show my kids to you as well, that you can see how God, how God changed my life from his prayer. I would share my kids to you. Here is my daughter. Her name is Abigail Kashan. Hello everyone. God bless you. And she is my daughter, Eliza. Through his prayer, God will bless me, Eliza and Elijah. He is my son, Elijah. Say hello to everyone, Elijah. Hello, everyone. Say God bless you. God bless you. So praise the Lord. Uh, I would love to share with you, and I have a request with all of all our friends uh, to be a blessing of fatherless children in Pakistan. So be a blessing for all orphanage we are supporting and look aftering here in Pakistan. So I would love to share you if you have a heart to sow a seed with us to be a blessing for this uh, orphanage children. They really need your love and support and sharing the love of God. The word of the Lord says, uh, love one another, bless one another and encourage one another. So you love to God put into your heart to be a blessing. So $30, if you, if you sow a seed uh, in our orphanage, so you can uh, support food and clothes uh, for a month for a child. So if you adopt a children uh, here in Pakistan for sharing a seven dollar a, a week, so you can support six months. So you can be a blessing for adoption of a children for a six months. Uh, I would love to share with you the heart that what is in my heart in Michelle 
and we are serving here in Pakistan uh, to be a blessing for those who really, really need the love of Jesus. So you are a, a part of a ministry and be a blessing. So I just give great thanks uh, to our dear brother again, uh, Pastor Elijah Hill, the Kingdom Perfectic uh, Ministry International. Uh, it's such a blessing for us and supporting us and uh, be stand with us. Uh, what situation is, what condition is. So I just would love to say, uh, save one meal, uh, feed one child. So you can save your one meal. The, you can save one meal uh, what you uh, you can sow into the life of one of our orphanage children. So it's such a great blessing for us and for those who really need it. So we just say thanks to all of you. And I just love to say you can just go to the web website of uh, Elijah Hill. Uh, as you know that uh, you can see the button on the uh, Elijah Hill's website. So you can just go and just click it and be a blessing. You have one touch, give a great smile to our children here in Pakistan. And you have one touch, give a life to our children. And you have one touch on the, on the donate button on the Elijah Hill ministry to be a blessing for, uh, for our broken hearts, those who really need uh, the food, they really need to des deserve it. So you press one button and you can press the heart of Jesus. And you can press one button, you can heart and touch the heart of Jesus Christ with your sowing seed of love to be a blessing for the fatherless and needy and children's head in Pakistan. So we just great uh, thanks for you that you can press the button of donation and be a blessing for the kingdom of God. It's such a privilege and honor for me and me and my wife and all my team and ministry, trust in God ministry, thankful for Elijah Hill and all you are dear friends, those who are blessing and lift up your hands and sow a seed and remember us, our children in your prayer. So God bless you, God bless you all and be a blessing for all of us and remember us in your prayer. Praise the Lord. We thank God for the service thus far. I hope you've been enjoying the service. You know, I know we've been, you know, placing certain parts in there and, you know, back and forth, but I hope you all bear with us. We're just trying to put everything together so everything will fit. Now, I'm going to continue on this series that I've been sharing with you all called The Mind of God. And I'm going to touch on two different points. And the points that I want to uh, touch on in my topic are number one will be God is the architect designing the outcome of your life to be for your good. I'm going to repeat that again. God is the architect designing the outcome of your life to be for your good. Point number two would be, God can take evil and disastrous things that happen in your life and turn it to your good. Let me say that again. God can take evil and disastrous things that happen in your life and turn it to your good. So the title of the message today is The Mind of God. So we're going to be taking a deeper look into God's mind. Now, we're going to start at Genesis the in the text. The undergirding text for this particular message will come out of Genesis, the first chapter and the 27th verse of scripture. And it reads as thus. So God created man in his own image so god created man in his own image now it says here that god created man in his own image now this word here create so god created man in his own image now we know that the lord did create man in his resemblance and his likeness comparable to him but here uh, it says God created. So I want to look a little bit closer and let's dissect the word created. So God created man in his own image. All right. Now, the word created means bara. Bara is the Hebrew translation. It's pronounced bara. B-A-W-R-A-W. Bara. So God bara man in his own image. So God barad, that's the original Hebrew translation, God barad man in his own image. Now that word barad 
if you go into the dissection of the Hebrew, the original language, it means to create something, to shape, to form, to fashion something. Uh, basically, that's what it means. You're fashioning, you're shaping, you're forming it into what you want it to be. The word bara. So God bara man in his own image. And it goes on to say in that verse, Genesis 127, I want you to go to your Bibles and turn to it. It's the first book of the Bible in the New in the Old Testament. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So God talks about how he set up creation in such a way that the sex differentiation, God is the one that set in motion how that should be. All right. So it said God created man in his own image. Now, this is the part I want you to think about in relation to God is this. Now, the Lord basically is an architect because when God creates something, he has a plan in his mind. He has a, a certain thought that he wants to design. So an architect, and looking at the definition of an architect, it's a person who designs buildings and many uh and and in many cases that person supervises the construction of it so the lord designed man the lord is the architect of humankind you know we may come up with our own understanding of what we think is supposed to be in regard to creation in regard to god but god is the one that is the architect of uh, humankind. So he supervises, he supervised the first construction and the design of male and female, all right? So in looking at the aspect of God, the title is the mind of God. So in looking at the aspect of God's thinking and how God uh, looks at things, when an architect does something, what he does first is he creates a plan or he he draws something. He has it designed in a drawing. Whatever he wants to see, he first, you know, designs it and draws it. That's how he puts it together. All right. So, in other words, he already has it in his mind exactly how he wanted to create man, to create womankind. He already knew how he wanted that to be. Now, the thing is, is that in order to be an architect, God is an architect. And we're going to get into God's mind today concerning that, because as we look into the first part of this message, we're going to get into God is the architect designing the outcome of our lives to be for your good. So just how God uh, constructed Adam and how he wanted to create him, God also, he he's the architect of how your life goes. He's the architect of how things flow in your life. He, he does it just like an architect, just like he did it in Genesis in the beginning. So in order to be an architect, just to let you know a little bit about the mind of God, because God says this in Isaiah 55 and 11, he says, so shall my word be that go forth out of my mouth. It shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper where I send it. Now, another piece of that verse is the upper two verses that talks about the issue of uh, God's thoughts. He said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Uh, your ways are not my ways. So God has different ways of thinking. So he thinks like an architect. What an architect does, if you see homes out there and you go to a subdivision, it's beautiful. You love what you see. Somebody was an architect that first designed those homes, put them together. And when they put those homes together, the architect designed it into a drawing and, and did specs on it, measurements, exactly how he wanted it to be created before those homes were even done in that subdivision. Then the construction workers came in and did exactly what the architect had constructed in his mind, in his design. So a part of being an architect is drawing, number one. So God draws in his mind. He does visualization. It's like in the beginning when God said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. So God already visualized when it was dark, he visualized how it should look, the trees, the birds, the plants, 
the water, the ocean. God already had a visualization. He's a visualizer, just like an architect visualizes that subdivision before it's ever built. And so part of the characteristic of being an, in, an architect is, is having the knowledge of engineering, math, science, physics. You have to have a handle on measuring, uh, designing. So when God made man and formed him in his image, he measured him. He measured how he should be. He measured how his sex should be. He measured how his head should look. He measured how his arm should look. He measured how his body should be shaped. If you look at a woman's body, her body is not shaped the same as a man. A man's body is not shaped the same as a woman. Why? Because God is an architect. He already designed. He's the fashion designer. When a woman, you look at a woman and say, oh, she's, she looks beautiful. Well, God is the fashion designer. He's the originator of fashion. He fashioned her how she should appeal to the eyes of humankind. He fashioned the man. A man, a woman looks at him. Oh, he's a nice looking guy. Yes, if you look at him, God designed how that should be. All right. Now, what I want to talk about is God as an architect in relation to our lives. Now, now I brought up the introduction about Adam, but let's look at the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29 and 11. All right. So let's go there. This is what it says in Jeremiah. It says, but well, I know the thoughts that I think of you. This is God talking now to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, God said to Jeremiah, I know, Jeremiah, the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. So God said, I have thoughts of you. Now, if you look at the other uh, translations of this particular verse, it says, for I know the plans that I have for you. See, plans are what an architect designs before he the, the construction comes on for the building. See, God said, I have a design in mind. I know the plans that I have for you. I know the plans that I, I'm the architect of your life. I know the plans that I have for you. All right. So God has a, he has a plan. He has a design. He knows exactly how your life is going to go. Even sometime when you don't know how your life is going to go. Now look at what's so powerful in the sense of, he said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Now watch this. He said to give you peace and not of evil. Now, it's translated in one translation. The New Living Translation says they are plans for good and not for disaster, okay, to give you a future and a hope. Now, so the question is, is why is it sometimes in our lives that things don't go well? Or even in a Christian's life, we're not perfect. Things don't always go right. Things don't always go the way you want it to go, right? But God said, I know the plans that I have for you. Now watch this. The plans, meaning the design, the architectural scheme of how your life is going to go. Now look at this. It says plans for good and not for disaster. Now, disasters do happen in Christians' lives. Things negative do happen in Christians' lives. All right. Now, what God is saying here, that word thought, Meshebeth, is the word I know the thoughts and I have for you. Meshebeth is the translation. The pronunciation is M-A-H-A-S-A-B-A. -A -A Meshebeth. Meshebeth. I know the Meshebeth that I have for you. You know what that translation means in Hebrew? It means I know the design, the device, the plan, the purpose. Watch this. The invention. See, God invents how your life is going to go. So when negative things happen, when disasters happen, when things that don't make no sense to you happen in your life, it's part of God's plan too, see? But what God does, he turns it to your good. That's the difference, hallelujah. He allows you, maybe you ran that red light and it could have been an accident, but it could have been a dis disaster, but God worked it out so that the car did not hit you. You see, that's how God works. He, 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 he said it's not for disaster, praise the Lord. Or you can have the accident and the car rolls over and somehow, some way, you come out of the accident free of being uh, in a critical situation. God said, I know the plans that I have for you. In other words, he's the architect. He's, arch 
architecturally working how your life should be. Not saying that the negative is not going to be there because the negative is what God uses to get the glory. All right. God uses the negative things to get the glory. But what he does do, he works it to your good. All right. So now let's take a look at that verse that I'm basically touching on here. Romans. Let's go to your Bibles in Romans 8 and 28 so you can understand what pastor's saying here. It says, and we know that all things, watch this, we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God. All things, all things work together. Yes, God is the architect. In other words, it can happen negative, but God will turn it to your good. He will make it shoot. so he gets the glory and you are benefited out of the situation. So when we ask the question, Lord, why am I going through this? Father, why are these circumstances happening in my life? Why does it seem like I keep in encountering this? Or why are people fighting me? Why are negative things occurring in my life? But God is saying, don't hold on. I, I, I know the plans that I have. And even though that may come your way, but because I'm God, I'm going to work it to your good. In other words, the outcome is going to be to your good. The outcome, the end result. You see, God is a mathematical genius. He's the engineer. He knows exactly how it's going to look. It may look rough when they first start designing at home. It may look out of place. It may look discombobulated. But the outcome is what you see when you drive by and say, hey, I would love to live here in this place. And that's how God does. The Lord, beloved, he knows the outcome of your life. Now, let's look at an example of this in the Bible. For example, let's go to Genesis 50 and 17. Genesis 50 and 17. Now, this is what it says. This is the story of Joseph. And it says, so shall ye say unto Joseph, forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto, did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of God, of thy father. They were asked, his brothers were asking Joseph, forgive us for what we did because we became, your, we're your own biological brothers, but we became the enemy to our brother. We became the enemy to the individual that was our biological brother. And he says, and thee forgive the trespasses of the servants of God thy father. And Joseph wept, the Bible says, when they spake unto him. He started crying, 18th verse. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, behold, we be thy servants. Hallelujah. Now, in the beginning of this particular story, it really starts in Genesis 37, all right, where Joseph was a young boy and he had dreams that God had shown him that he was going to be uh, elevated over his brothers, even though he was the youngest of all of them. All right. This is what it says in Genesis 37. This is how I started. Now, that's the outcome, what you see over in Egypt. But what I read in the 50th chapter, but if you go to Genesis 37, this is how it started. Genesis 37 and 17, it says, and the man said, they are departed thence for he I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, his own biological brothers, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. They made up in their minds because he had a dream that he was over us. We're going to try to kill our brother. All right. He had a dream, right? Some people will kill you for your dream. Some people will come against you for your success. Some people in your family uh, are jealous because you're more successful than them, or God blessed you in areas that he maybe didn't bless them. And, and so when a person is a dreamer or a person is blessed, sometimes people come against them and come against the dream. In the 19th verse, in Genesis 37, it says, and they said unto one another, behold, this dreamer cometh. See, this dreamer come. Sometimes people, oh, who do you think you are? Why do you believe you're going to be rich? Why do you believe you can marry that man? Why do you believe that you can have that woman? Why do you believe that you can have this kind of success in your life? 
See, when you speak of the good things that you believe that God will give you favor in his plan, sometimes people fight against that and come against you because they don't like your positivity and your faith in God. 20th verse, come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into the pit. And we will say some evil beast hath devoured him and we shall see what will come of his dream. In other words, the dream God gave to Joseph, but his brothers in the natural, in the physical, in the flesh said, we're going to naturally plot against him and conspire against him. Don't you know some of you are anointed? That's why people conspire against you. Because of your anointing, that's why people plot against you. That's the reason why that's part of the anointing. That's part of being blessed is people conspiring against you. And you got to understand it as part of the plan so that God in the end is going to get the glory and your outcome will be better than the end. So let's go back to Genesis 50. All right. That's where it started. Genesis 37. They did sell him into Egypt. All these negative things happened to Joseph. They thought they could just get rid of him. Joseph was blessed. He ended up being exalted and put in a position in Pharaoh's house where his brothers after a famine had to come to Egypt in order to exist. This is where they repented before Joseph because they found out that the very brother that they tried to destroy his dreams, it had come to pass. See, that's why you got to look at the outcome of the thing. You can't look at the circumstances where it may be evil now. You may have went through the life, but that doesn't mean God can't keep you. Or you may even get struck, but it doesn't mean that God can't take you through it where you come out you know, in health or what have you. So this is what the end is here in, uh, let's go back to Genesis 50, 19. And Joseph said unto them, fear not, this is what he said to his brother, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, you're, you thought evil against me. That's when they were saying, we're going to kill the dreamer in the family. Joseph said, you thought evil against me. Read it here in Genesis 50 and 20. But God meant it unto good. You see how God is an architect. So God says, I, I'm going to work it to your good. Even though you'll get sold into slavery, even though they'll reject you, even though people will put you down, even though people will dislike you because you're positive about your future and your dream. But he said, God will work it to your good. Hallelujah. And that goes back to the mind of God. That's how the mind of God thinks. God is the architect designing the outcome of your life to be for your good. So beloved, let's not fear when negative things occur. It only means that God is going to work an outcome that will be to your good because he's an architect. He's designing something. All right. God bless you. We'll continue on this message, the mind of God, uh, next Sunday.